Previously, we have discussed about the way of thinking or situations that are not experimental. Then, what makes the study an experiment to say that something is causally related? For a study to be an experiment, there are several design components required to ensure the validity and reliability. Among those components, we will talk about three of them, a need for a comparison group, replication, and the random allocation. So to illustrate why those components are needed, let's take a hypothetical study where you want to test the efficacy of a drug to cure or treat a disease. So you developed um, this drug called Miracle Cure and give this drug to a patient suffering from unknown disease. So after taking the drug, the patient seems to get better. Now the question is then, how do we know if the recovery is because of the drug, because of the drug, not something else, when we see the patient gets better? So there may be other reasons behind the recovery than the drug. For example, it may be just all psychological. So to eliminate other alternative um, explanations of experimental results, then the hypothesized effect of the experimental manipulation, um, in this case drug, we need a control group. So that was our research hypothesis. So we give the, uh, give the patient drug and looks like uh, it actually treat the patient. But what if, right? So we have this counter hypothesis. So if our research hypothesis is correct, then if we remove the drug, then the patient should stay sick, right? So here is our patient again, and we just leave the patient uh, without giving them anything, and they should stay sick. Okay, so, um, this way we can make sure that it is the drug that cure the, um, you know, whatever disease this patient had. So, um, the selection and the use of proper controls are critical to ensure whether the experimental results are valid. There are two types of control groups, positive or negative control group, uh, which is shown in this counter hypothesis. So that is actually a negative control group. And negative control group um, is um, basically there is a no uh, manipulation or you can include inert manipulation, expect to show no or little effect or change where there should not. And the negative control can guard against the effect of expectation and or the regression toward the mean um, that may confound with the true effect in the experimental group. So you probably heard about placebo before, um, a placebo the word is actually coming from Latin, meaning I will please. Um, is a fake treatment, um, tablet, drop, pill, injection, and so on, um, which is administered as if it were a real one, but um, which has no therapeutic value other than the psychological feeling of being better. On the other hand, nocebo effect is the adverse reaction experienced by the patient who receives nocebo. Um, so in general, placebo effect refers to the positive effect experienced when a placebo improves patient's health-related condition when the patient believes that they are being treated. In fact, placebo does work for real to a certain extent and the effect has shown um, that larger pills uh, works better than the smaller pills, color pills works better than the white pills, and surgery works the best uh, compared to injection, 
and compare it to pills. By the way, you can also fake surgery to make it look like a, make it look like a real one too. Um, so this works. The placebo effect works even when the patients know that they were given a placebo. And because the reactions from placebo result from a patient's expectations or perceptions of how the substance or the treatment will affect the patients rather than being caused by the real effect from a biologically active component of the substance, you need to show that the size of the effect of the drug or treatment is at least statistically significant over and beyond the placebo effect to get the drug or treatment approved. And the only way you can show this is to employ a placebo controlled group against your experimental group. And another phenomenon that is quite closely related to the effect of placebo is called the regression toward the mean. So this is a um, statistical phenomenon that arises when the initial measurement of a random variable is extreme from the average, the subsequent measurement of the same variable will tend to be closer to the average or mean of the measurement. And um, so we can think of disease as a kind of an extreme health condition uh, away from the overall health. So when uh, intervention or drug is applied to treat a disease, any improvement, uh, if there was any, can be uh, the real effect of the intervention or the drug or simply due to the regression toward the mean. So for example, we all have ups and downs and good days and bad days. Our health also fluctuates with time. So let's say that the uh, horizontal axis represents the time passage and vertical axis uh, represents our health level. And also the blue dotted line represents our overall health level. And um, you know, in a moment, a curve will uh, be shown representing our health hovering around the um, overall health. So when you are here, right? So this is on top of the curve. You're the happiest person in the world. You're on top of the world. You feel like you can do anything, be anyone. But alas, as time goes by, your health starts to deteriorate. It's going down the hill. Now you don't feel so good and it doesn't stop there. You're getting depressed and your suicidal tendency increases. You're close to the rock bottom and you get sick. But you're not quite dead yet, but you feel like you're going to. You can't take it anymore and you feel like you gotta do something, otherwise you will really die. So you pour the little dose of the strongest painkillers from your stash into your mouth and crash. And after a while, you feel better and you thank to the pill you took, assuming that it helped the recovery. But wait, did it really? Um, you know, people typically seek out medical help when their symptoms are at worst. So <clears throat> you catch disease somewhere here, and you get sick, and then this is the point where people seek out um, the medical help, right? But then, you know, how do we know if the recovery was, um, you know, due to the effect of the drug or simply the regression toward the mean? I mean, there is no way we would know without a proper control group. If we buy into this regression toward the mean, then you will get better even if you don't do anything, unless this is a terminal disease or an instantly killing heart attack. So combined with this regression toward the mean, you will feel much better even if what you took was just a sugar pill. And therefore, the best way to combat this phenomenon is to divide the patient's group 
uh, randomly into uh, a drug or an intervention and a control group that does not receive the intervention. So if the drug really worked, then at least the drug will shorten the uh, recovery by pulling this part of the curve upward like this, right? So at least it should um, reduce the time it takes um, um, to suffer from the disease, right? So this is only possible, this comparison is only possible when you have a negative control group. Now we know the importance of a control group. However, a negative control group is not typically used whatever possible because of the obvious ethical reasons. Just imagine that you're sick um, but assigned to a negative control group in an experiment. So basically, you'll keep suffering from the disease without being properly treated throughout the experimental period. It is like you're deserted in pain on purpose for the sake of the experiment. So a positive control is typically used when there is already an established treatment such as gold standard known to work. The outcome from uh, this group expect to show uh, an effect or change where there should be because this is already established um, and it can be used to assess the validity of the experimental uh, group. So for our miracle cure experiment, we can compare the effect of the miracle cure against the control group given a generic painkiller like uh, you know, paracetamol. So here are the um, possible conditions in a controlled experiment and their respective ex expected outcomes from each condition. So on top, we have um, experimental condition where we give this patient um, a miracle cure. And the expectation from this condition is that the patient will get better after this um, miracle cure, right? And we have positive control condition where we give them a uh, generic painkiller that we know that it'll work up to a certain extent. So the expectation is again, uh, the patient should get better. And we have placebo control. Uh, so placebo control is um, kind of a negative control. And when they are given a sugar pill, right? And the overall expectation is that the patient will stay sick right or they're not get better they they they, they not get they, they don't get better um at least compared to uh, the positive control or the experimental condition overall right and finally negative control um so you just give them nothing and if you do that then they should stay sick right overall um Another essential component of an experimental design is the replication. So you would not generalize your results based on a single patient, right? Um, and people would not believe your results anyway, either from an experiment with n equals one. So you need to have as many patients as possible to make sure that you know what you have is for real and reliable. In addition, we know that measurements are subject to variation and uncertainty. Um, they should be repeated with many subjects and experiments should be replicated to estimate the true effect of treatment, uh, which is uh, represented by the accuracy and to strengthen the um, experiment's precision and generalizability. Any quantitative scientific experiment relies heavily on replicate measurements. Additional replicates generally yield more accurate and reliable summary statistics in uh, experimental work. Depending upon you know, which sources of variation are being studied, there can be different types of replicates, namely biological and technical replicates.
Technical replicates are repeated measurements of the same sample that represents independent measures of the random noise associated with protocols or equipment. On the other hand, biological replicates are parallel measurements of biologically distinct samples that capture random biological variation, which may self be a subject of study or a noise source. As an illustration, let's say you are preparing three sequencing libraries from RNA, ext uh, RNA extracted from the cells of a single mouse as shown in the left picture. In this case, those three RNA samples are technical replicates. In contrast, biological replication would mean extracting RNA from three different mice as shown in uh, the right picture. In the former, the number of biological sample is one, so n equals one, whereas three in the letter. So it is not always clear to tell the difference between uh, the biological and the technical replicates uh, because it depends on the, um, the research context and the question you're asking. But if you are more interested in an individual or a method, then the technical replicates are good enough. However, if you want to make a proper inference about the population from which the sample arises, or if you're interested in a group difference, then you need more biological rather than technical samples. Last but not least component of an experimental design is the random allocation, which is the process to make the allocation of the sample to the respective groups by chance alone so that it is unpredictable who gets what. So this is the only way to guarantee that any differences in the outcome measures are due to the effects of the experimental manipulation rather than to some unknown underlying differences between the groups. So this process, um, the random allocation, is more effective with a large number of samples. And allocation bias undermines the causal inference between the treatment and the observed effect. So uh, we talked about this counterfactual ideal comparison group already in core study design. So to make sure that the effect of drug is real, you need a control group. Um, but to make this comparison absolutely, absolutely fair and square, you want to have a control group that was um, exactly the same as the experimental group, um, except that they would not get the treatment. Right? But then we know that this is a counterfactual ideal because it is impossible for the same person to be both um, control and experimental group at the same time. Alternatively, um, we can have a lot of sample and split them into the respective groups using random allocation, hoping that their individual differences and any other extraneous variables we cannot control are spread between the groups more or less evenly to establish the baseline comparability between the groups. So here we have a sample with different colors representing individual differences such as age, sex, and other variables we cannot modify. With random allocation, we hope that these individual differences are spread more or less equally over to each group so that they can, have, uh, they can be evened out on average. So this is what it means by how random allocation replaces the equality of individual with the average equality of groups. We cannot achieve the equality of individuals in each group in real life, and that's why it's called a counterfactual ideal. However, we can um, approximate um, this um, equality of individuals with the average equality of groups through random allocation so that we can start the experiment from an equal footing. 
Now you've finished your data collection and it is time to analyze your data. Very roughly speaking, there can be two types of data analysis. The first one is called an exploratory or descriptive data analysis that you already know how to do what to do. Um, you summarize or visualize the collected data with graphs, tables, and or numbers to have an insight of the data. In this stage of data analysis, you want to look out uh, if there is an emerging pattern from the data or to check if the data satisfy certain conditions for a further statistical analysis called a confirmatory or inferential analysis. Here, I want to emphasize that you do not run any confirmatory or inferential analysis without running the exploratory data analysis first. If your study is descriptive in nature, then it's okay to run and report the exploratory data analysis only, but you cannot skip the exploratory data analysis and report only the inferential analysis result when your study is analytical or experimental, where you are formally testing your hypotheses. For now, it is enough to know that the exploratory data analysis are the basis of um, most studies, but we will come back to each analysis and study them in much more detail uh, later on. Now you've completed your analysis and it's time to let others know what you have found and communicate with them about your findings. There are a number of routes you can disseminate your findings. You can make a presentation either with a poster or a PowerPoint in front of your friends or colleagues, but better yet, you can write a paper to publish in a relevant scientific journal. It would be useful to understand how a scientific paper is structured when the time comes for you to write one, but it will be also useful when you need to read and critique other papers if you know what to expect from each section of a scientific paper. So typically, a scientific paper is composed of these seven separate sections, a title, an abstract, introduction, methods, results, conclusion and discussion, and the reference. So in the next slides, we will take a look at each section in more detail, one by one. A title can help you or others to determine if an article is interesting or relevant. In fact, the title will be the first information you will see when you use bibliographic database to do a literature search. So the information included in the title will, en will enable you to quickly determine if this paper will be relevant to your research or not. One of the information you can find from a title uh, typically contains the goal of the study. Once you know the goal of the study, then you can also figure out what the research hypotheses will be too. Another information you can find from a title can be a type of samples used in the study. Sometimes title indicates the type of research conducted, uh, for example, if the study is experimental or observational, even though the title does not say explicitly what it is. Finally, we may be able to find about a brief in indication of the results. In summary, a title provides a reasonably complete description of the conducted study, and sometimes even foreshadows the findings. Next, you will find an abstract after the title. Along with the title, abstract will be very important for your literature review because it is more or less a complete summary of the entire paper. In general, the abstract is composed of all the sections of a complete paper 
except the size of each section is just a miniature of the original sections. Most of the time, an abstract of a paper is included in the bibliography database for free, whereas a full paper is not. For literature review, you will read the title and abstract first to quickly filter out irrelevant studies to your research. However, when you write your own paper, this will be the last section of the paper to be written because you can write it only when you know everything about your research. In the introduction, you can find theoretical background information such as a brief history of previous research and their results from which the current study arises. So in this section, you should be able to identify the rationale of the research. So in other words, why the authors to do what they do. So which, which should be the same for you to write your own paper. You should make it clear why you do what you do in the introduction. You can also find a specific research question or hypothesis to be tested at the end of the introduction. In a real publication, your research hypothesis is essentially the same as the goal of the study. In the meta section, you will find the detailed information about how authors perform their experiment or research, including the type of samples or subjects and how they were recruited. Also, you will be able to find the information about specific techniques, equipment, or apparatus used in the research, and the information about the experimental design and overall procedures can be found. Even though people um, don't pay a good attention reading this section, um, this section should include enough details about the experiments so that other researchers in the field can repeat the procedure when needed. The next results section is at the heart of a heart of a scientific paper. It contains the data presented in the form of tables and lower figures. So in this section, uh, visualization uh, visualization is at, uh, is the key uh, to the presentation. Even though um, not very common, but more and more authors are asked to provide their raw data these days. So whenever and wherever they are available, um, make sure that you take time to analyze them on your own if you can and compare your own analysis with the author's analysis. Conclusion and discussion sections are sometimes presented separately or they're combined under either conclusion or discussion or both. So this section typically starts with a brief summary of the results section in a non-technical and more plain language. This is the section where you can find the author's interpretation of the results by relating them with other previous research. You can also find the implication of the research or suggestions of possible improvements or ideas for future research. While reading this section, try to understand what's presented in your own language and to take different perspectives from the author's viewpoint whenever, wherever you can. The key is to remain skeptical throughout reading this section. And at the end of the paper, uh, you will find a list of sources read by the authors and cited throughout the paper, meaning that only the read and cited sources can be included in the reference section. So the final list in this section is not the list of the entire collection of literature search. So what's not cited in the main body text doesn't get included in the reference section. Therefore, their entry should match each other. And this is a formal way to show how serious we are about treating the intellectual property 
and to acknowledge uh, the intellectual ownership to the ideas that do not originate from us. Um, the style of reference is different from journal to journal, but GCU recommends Harvard style for students' projects and dissertations. And congratulations, you've just completed a cycle of conducting a research. In fact, you've just opened up an infinite loop of conducting research. Um, any good research should generate more questions or ideas for future research at the end of the cycle, rather than closing the loop or hitting the dead end. And that's how science evolves and progresses. In fact, research process is similar to cooking in that they are fun, but can be frustrating many times. It can be messy, especially if this is your first time cooking or running research. Anyone can be a good researcher, um, as anyone can be a good cook. But for a good result, you need to plan ahead. For example, when you cook, you probably want to cook something that you'd like to eat, unless you cook this for someone else to poison. Likewise, you'll be better off if you work on the research out of your best interest. Once you know what you like to cook, then it'll be helpful to have a recipe. Likewise, it may be helpful if you outline why you do what you do and how you would do before you do your research, which is basically what a research proposal is all about. Now, you can go out and shop around to collect the right ingredients for your research. When you do, you need to look around as many resources to find good, quality information. At the early stage, you don't want to be frugal. You should be voracious from the start and tasting and sifting through the ingredients to check their quality and freshness. Once collected, then store and organize them with care. Now you can cook them, but you need to choose the right tools to do so. Uh, for example, you need to identify a proper statistics to use to analyze the data, which you should have uh, considered already as a part of your re a recipe beforehand. You cannot just throw all the ingredients and mix them into a pan at the same time. You need to synthesize them and make them connected together to produce quality information. Your work is not done yet. Um, you want to show off and tell everyone that the work you created belongs to you uh, by putting your own understanding of the ingredients and recipe with your own voice. Go out and disseminate your work in the forms of poster, talk or paper to claim your intellectual ownership. Of course, it may have sounded too good to be true uh, with beautiful pictures of food, but this picture might reflect the true reality of research. But hey ho, as people say, no pain, no gain, no guts, no glory. If you don't try, you won't learn anything. So you should keep trying until you get it right someday.